welcome to Wellbeing Wednesdays. Each Wednesday at one o'clock, we at the Museums of the University of St Andrews will be encouraging you to take 10 minutes for a break to listen to museum story time. Our collections are full to the brim with objects that have had fascinating lives and their stories are well worth listening to. So take 10 minutes, relax and enjoy. So today on Museum Storytime, I'll be featuring our painting by John Duncan of Mary Queen of Scots at Fotheringay. So this was painted by Duncan in 1929, but it captures a moment in 1587. And that moment is the final hours in the life of Mary Queen of Scots. So she's, of course, one of Scotland's most significant historical figures and she's often portrayed as a tragic, romantic heroine who had a rather unceremonious end for um, a queen. Duncan painted a really quite romanticised and sympathetic view of Mary. So John Duncan was a Scottish artist. He was born in the Hilltown area of Dundee in 1866. And the painting that we're going to be speaking about today was Duncan's last sort of major artwork in his career. So he was involved in Patrick Geddes's Celtic Revival and Celtic revivalists often used Mary Queen of Scots as a means of connecting to their neo-Jacobitism. Now the Celtic Revival was criticised for being too Catholic um, which is interesting because Duncan himself and um, Geddes, neither of them were, were Catholic um, but they did believe that Scottish Presbyterianism was stifling the culture of Scotland. So this painting was commissioned by Sir David Russell, um, a paper manufacturer of Tullus Russell fame and a philanthropist. Now, this was a portrait that was commissioned after one that um, Duncan had painted and then exhibited at the Royal Scottish Academy. Um, that was actually bought by a Glasgow businessman. Now, Russell's commission of this painting allowed John Duncan to make some adjustments and he wrote to David Russell in 1929 in December saying, I felt and feel that my most imperative duty was to get the real Mary and then present her as sympathetically as I could. Now, as for the story being told in the painting, hours before she died, Mary found out that she was to be executed by beheading the next morning, which was famously ordered by her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I of England. She's remembered as being remarkably composed when faced with her death warrant and when she appeared at her execution and that is how she is portrayed in this painting by Duncan. So Duncan has painted her as if she's in a prayer-like state. She's meditative. She's clutching her rosary and her book. And accounts from her execution detail just how dignified and composed she was at the time. So in this painting, she wears her iconic black velvet dress with her white veil and ruff as in many of her contemporary portraits and Duncan had studied these absolutely extensively and he even noted down a kind of fattiness about the eyes um, which he was to accommodate in the painting that we have in our collection. So in this painting Mary is joined by two of her ladies-in-waiting who were there for her till the very end. We have Jane Kennedy on the left and Elizabeth Curl on the right. Now, these women were there for Mary in her final hours. They read to her, they spoke to her, and they helped her to get her affairs in order ahead of her execution. They helped her to share out her possessions and the money that she had to those who had been faithful to her. So Elizabeth herself was given little enamel portraits of Mary, Francis II, her first husband, and her son James. So Mary actually also requested that Elizabeth was to receive a marriage portion, which is quite significant. So Jane and Elizabeth often feature in artworks of this subject for that reason. 
So they actually accompanied Mary to the scaffold. Um, they undressed her and Jane helped to blindfold her. Um, and they, when, they, when they undressed her, they revealed a dark crimson layer underneath her black gown, um, which was known as being the colour of martyrdom in the Catholic Church. Um, so Mary was really making quite a bold statement up until the very end about her religion. So Duncan makes the grief of Jane and Elizabeth really, really visible in the painting that we have. Um, he gave great importance to colours and their symbolism and he painted Jane in a green dress to symbolise uh, grief. Now, our famous Queen of Scots also had some less well-known connections to the town of St Andrews and its university. So whilst preparing for childbirth, um, she wrote a note, um, which is now in the collection of the National Records of Scotland. Now, in this note, she writes, I leave my books, which are those in Greek or Latin, to the University of St Andrews to start a library there. Now, she didn't die at this point, obviously, um, but her son, who was James VI and James I, um, did donate some of the founding books to the university library. These books remain in our university special collections to this day, which is fantastic. I've been lucky enough to see them myself. Um, and it's well known that Mary enjoyed spending time in St Andrews. Who doesn't? Um, she had quite significant moments in her life that took place in St Andrews, one of those being that it was when she was in the town that she found out about the assassination of her favourite uncle, um, who was Francis, Duke of Guise, in 1563. Now, according to legend, and I feel like this is quite a nice way to finish off our story for today, she, it was in that year that she planted a hawthorn tree, um, which is now known as Queen Mary's Hawthorn, which is in the quadrangle at St Mary's College on South Street. And they think that it was perhaps in memory of her late uncle. Now, the fantastic thing about that is that Queen Mary's Hawthorn still stands in St Mary's Quad to this day. So when we can all get out and about safely again, it would be a lovely thing to pay a visit. Tune in to next week's Wellbeing Wednesday Museum Storytime to find out another fascinating story about one of the objects in our collection. See you next time. Bye.